everyone. Welcome to our May Nature Talks. This talk is about hemlock forests and how we may control tiny invaders in this tall, noble evergreen. This is our monthly talks, and we do this on the first Tuesdays of every month with a rotating team. And this month is Hemlock Forest. We are so lucky tonight to be joined by our own Donna Crossland. Donna will be talking to us tonight about the long-lived evergreen species of the Canadian forest, the Eastern Hemlock, and a tiny invader, Hemlock Woody, adulged that is threatening this quest essential mature forest species and we and what we can do about it so folks if you have any questions please send it in the chat and i will try my best to answer your questions we will be muting everyone so there's no disruption during the presentation that said, if you're a new year folks, I will make sure there's some information about Nature Nova Scotia and how you can get involved with Nature Talks in the future. I am so excited for this presentation tonight because hemlock is a dominant component of old growth forests and it provides unique habitat for a variety of wildlife species. Therefore, I'm looking forward to learning more about it and what I can do to help protect hemlock forests. So Donna, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and we can go right into the presentation. Also, just a heads up folks, we're gonna be recording tonight uh, for our YouTube channel. So feel free to get off camera or come on camera. Thank you. So I, I have just retired from Kajimakujik National Park uh, where I spent 27 and a half years uh, with Parks Canada working in various national parks in Eastern Canada as a national park warden and then later as a biologist. I have a master's of science in forestry and I think I've spent my whole life uh, learning about our uh, Wabanagi Acadian forest and uh, I'm always learning uh, something new. Just yesterday I was out with uh, several people from the Healthy Forest Coalition and um, learn learning about lichens and and uh, anyway there's always something new it's an incredibly complex ecosystem but I'll share with you a little bit tonight about um, some some news on hemlock uh, I need to be able to share my screen unity I can so welcome everybody it's a pleasure to share a little bit about hemlock forest in Nova Scotia and the hemlock Lea delgid, the teeniest, tiniest invasive species we can imagine uh, coming to hemlock forest near everyone. Uh, and so I'll, uh, I'll uh, proceed at a fairly rapid pace uh, with a little bit about the tree and a little bit about the uh, bug. And uh, hopefully I'll have time to ask questions in the end, but in the center of the screen, here we see uh, a, a giant eastern hemlock tree. And to your left, presumably it's your left, uh, there's the hemlock woolly adelgid, those little tiny white woolly balls on the underside of uh, the new growth of hemlock. And to the right are uh, some dead hemlock that was just photographed by Sally Steele uh, from Environment and Climate Change as we flew over Nova Scotia this spring and uh, looked at certain protected areas that uh, they administer. So without further ado, Eastern Hemlock, it's a, a forest giant. Pardon me, I'm just moving things around still. It's the largest uh, uh, Eastern conifer that we have in our forest. It can grow uh, up to a meter in diameter, sometimes more than that. So it, in girth, it's the largest of all of our conifer trees. It creates some dense, dark shade with, with an incredible uh, wide spreading canopy and broken branches are typical in the understory as we see here in this picture. Um, it's considered by some to be the redwood of the east because it's so large um, and it, it really, it epitomizes the last of our old growth forests in Nova Scotia. 
uh, it because it wasn't a considered a commercial species, it hasn't been heavily harvested. And so most of our old growth consists of hemlock as well as as beech and other species that are less commercially sought after. And before we leave this page, I just want to draw attention to Suga canadensis, the, the scientific name of Eastern hemlock. Suga in Japanese, which this is a Japanese word, Suga, means mother tree. And it's a very fitting term for the hemlock because it is a tree that extends kind of a motherly protection over many other species in, in the forest. And it's perhaps its highest value in the forest is it, it, what it does for other species in our Wabanagi Acadian forest. It's, it may be the largest tree in girth and, and stout and sturdy and built to last up to 400 years or more, but it's also the most delicate tree. And so it has these soft, feathery, pliable boughs and the new growth that will be out next month. And when it flushes, it's this bright lime green color like in the photo that I'm showing here. It's, it's just, just feathery and delicate and, and very, very beautiful. So it's aesthetically among the most beautiful trees we have, as well as being the largest. And it's very well suited across Nova Scotia. It was the dominant tree species, uh, Lukes, who created the earliest forest classification system of the Maritimes in 1959, declared uh, Southwest Nova Scotia in the salmon pink color that you see there. It, he declared this the red spruce hemlock pine zone, the area where these three species were the most dominant. Sorry, I'm still moving things around on my screen uh, so I can see. And so this is what, so it, it was an incredibly uh, vast stretches of dark hemlock forest in the early days uh, when he, Europeans first um, arrived in Nova Scotia. And the light pink areas uh, on the map of uh, Luke's forest classification were also part of the, the red spruce hemlock pine zone. Uh, it was the lowlands eco region. Uh, and he states prior to repeated burnings, red spruce, hemlock and white pine were probably more abundant there. And indeed, I believe he, was, he is absolutely correct because I spent a, a, a large portion of my life, 12 years, in Rishabukto area working in Kujibukwak National Park here in eastern New Brunswick and there I did uh, research in historical forest ecology and I researched witness trees specifically uh, and those are the trees that mark the boundaries of uh, early surveyed plots of land as Europeans started to arrive and settle uh, in eastern New Brunswick it mostly happened uh, in the early 1800s and so I was able to look and find a lot of these early survey sketches and mapped over 2,500 witness trees. And amongst those witness trees, the surveyors always marked what was the species of tree in those early days. Uh, and so uh, this was of interest to me because in Kujibukwak, I was looking at this rather ugly poor cousin of the white pine tree, the jack pine tree. And so it's, it's jack pine dominated there now and, and trembling aspen, most of the forests in Kujibukwak are early successional. And so I wondered before um, the Europeans frequently set those woods on fire, what kind of forests were there? And so the witness trees allowed me to learn that this was the species frequency that, uh, that could be determined from the witness tree record. And Suga, or Eastern hemlock was the second most dominant species. In terms of species frequency, it was over 16% of, of the tree species frequency in the early forests of the 1800s. So um, the witness tree species record, by the way, detected 22 species recorded and no jack pine detected. And so what was incredible there was in as little as 200 years, the Europeans had radically altered the forest composition from this dark hemlock dominated forests with spruce and yellow birch to
to this early successional uh, jack pine, trembling aspen, red maple forest. And so today, much of the hemlock in Nova Scotia is reduced to these, these red patches on this map that was produced by the Department of Natural Resources and Renewables. Um, and so only about 8% of forest land actually has uh, any, any amounts of hemlock uh, comprising it. And most of the hemlock in Nova Scotia remains on private land where there's been maybe some better forestry that's allowed allowed the, this tree to persist. It's very fire sensitive. It doesn't like to grow up in clear cuts. And so uh, it, is, it is vastly diminished from what it was in the early days. But historically, I like to live in the past, I guess. I go by Colonel Gubbins who traveled around the maritime provinces in the early, early 1800s. And he, he talked about the evergreens of the fir kind deepened the gloom amongst these, the hemlock tree was very conspicuous. And uh, indeed, many early settlers complained of the gloom. Uh, and John McLean uh, actually wrote a, a, a poem in Gaelic, but it's translated to English called The Gloomy Forest. And he wasn't very happy as he settled up around near a Picto area. And, actually said uh, that um, he cannot frame a song as he once could. Oops, I'm sorry, I didn't see the bottom of it. <laughs> I can't only see part of my screen. So I guess you can see the rest. But when you come here, little will you spy, but soaring forest shutting out the sky. So it's a forest giant on the edge now because of a tiny invasive called hemlock woolly adelgids. So we'll go into its biology a little bit. David Foster wrote a book, um, which I guess I didn't refer to because I can't see the screen, um, called The Hemlock, a Forest Giant on the Edge. So if you have a chance to read that book, it's very informative. And so this is what um, our hemlock forests are looking like in the Southwest right now, especially in the three most Southwestern counties you start to see these gray ghosts where the hemlock has literally dropped and depleted of its needles, dropped its needles, been its uh, the sap is being literally sucked out of the needle canopy. And so you, they're quite distinctive. And the Canadian Food Inspection Agency is following the, um, the detections of hemlock woolly adelgid as it spreads from the southwest eastward throughout the province. And so now uh, we found new detections in the Bridgewater area in Lunenburg County, as well as in Kings County. And so Kings County and Lunenburg can be considered now to be on the leading edge of the infestation while the rest of the southwest is quite heavily infested in most areas now. So this little tiny bug, it's quite unfair. It's trying, you're trying to fight an enemy you can't see most of the time. So you can see the size of the needles there. So this is a, actually a picture taken by Jeff Ogden who works for Department of Natural Resources and Renewables. And this is uh, the, the hemlock woolly adelgid called the woolly adelgid because it secretes a white woolly substance. Uh, it's waxy, it's not, it looks woolly, but it's actually like a white waxy substance out of the sides of its body. And it grows throughout the winter. It's a very strange insect in, in terms of it's active all winter long and then doesn't feed during the summer. Uh, but here's a little crawler in the center of the picture. It looks like a little, um, a little tiny egg with legs. The eggs look almost the same size. So it's aphid-like. Um, sucks nutrients and water from the base of needles. It's always at the base of needles. So a lot of people will say, oh, is this hemlock woolly adelgid? Well, if it's up on the needles, it's probably a spider egg sac or something else because this is consistently always at the base of needles. I just circled it there. Um, and so mortality of hemlock is relatively fast. It depends on a lot of... Um, uh, of um, factors uh, such as uh, if we get a very cold winter like we did this year as as soon as we drop below minus 20 or minus 25 
there can be quite substantial mortality, winter mortality, and that can slow it down. But uh, we've been, from what we've been seeing so far in the Southwest, it looks like it can kill a hemlock tree in as little as three to 10 years. And there's no natural predators. We have detected a few insects feeding on the woolly adelgid, but um, they don't seem to make a dent in the population. They're not slowing it down. So it really doesn't have any natural predators. And so it's been spreading up and down the Eastern seaboard of US and now Canada since about 1951. It was introduced first into Virginia and from there it spread south. It's uh, decimated the Carolinian uh, hemlock, uh, Suga Carolinia, uh, Carol Carolinia, I think it's called, and as well as the Eastern hemlock, Suga canadensis. So this is the distribution map. And the, the green, I'll just draw your attention, is the uh, range of Eastern hemlock. So it's, it's rapidly expanding into the remaining area where Eastern hemlock is found. And it seems that it's becoming more resistant to our winter conditions. So it's got a fascinating life cycle. Uh, it really has been, uh, um, it was dormant all summer. And then mid-October, it started, uh, it broke its dormancy, its estivation, as we call it. It started growing and it gets bigger and bigger, progresses through its instars throughout the winter, growing more and more wool as it goes. And so along about this time of year is when it's most visible. So it's a very good time of year to go out and start looking for the woolly adelgid. Uh, this month, the next month are the very, very best, although it's starting to rain crawlers, eggs and crawlers on our heads. Uh, so we have to be careful to uh, make sure we decontaminate. I'm gonna hit that in a minute. Um, so it's, um, it only takes one population, one individual hemlock woolly adelgid to start a whole new population because uh, it doesn't produce sexually in Canada. So it doesn't need a mate. Uh, and uh, so if anybody's studied biology, they'll remember the term parthenogenesis. So that's what she does. So they're all girls. Um, there are some winged females by the time we get to the second generation. And we see, um, so we're just finishing the first generation, which is in the middle of the screen. And then we progress very, very rapidly through a second generation of adelgids. Uh, and they end up settling out on the new growth flush when the new growth, that lime green, uh, new uh, twigs develop uh, in June, they will settle out on, on that at the base of the needles. And at that point, there will be some winged females, but they lead a very lonely life because uh, they go off um, looking for a spruce species that we don't have in Canada. And so it's kind of a dead end for them. But the little tiny crawlers are what uh, um, can be falling on our heads, our hats, uh, Fifi the dog, uh, and we can have up to 1,100 crawlers falling down that we won't see in the middle of an infested forest, 1,100 crawlers per day per square meter. So um, there's a good chance that you can take this home with you, so do be careful. So, uh, and so just one of those crawlers, if you take it and take it into a new hemlock forest that isn't infested, one female can produce up to 5,000 potential offspring in a single year. So it's incredible how fast this spreads. So it can be spread by birds. We think that's how it got to Nova Scotia in the first place, but certainly it can be moved around on firewood. Uh, you know, it, it's falling on all kinds of things in the forest. So it may not even be moved on hemlock in order to get here. It could be on a piece of spruce or it could be on boughs of pine, uh, but it's, so humans are mostly the cause of spreading um, most of our invasive species around, but the adelgid may be sticking to the feathers of birds that are migrating northward in the, in the spring and coming over and feeding on our, our, and breeding in our hemlock forests in Nova Scotia. But certainly even the wind can transport it a short, fairly short distances. Um, like I say, be careful of your pets. And more and more, it's important that we remember not to move firewood over long distances because we actually have three uh, forest invasives in Nova Scotia right now 
Uh, the beech leaf mining weevil that is definitely be, be being moved around on firewood and uh, and the emerald ash borer, another one that I'm sure got to Nova Scotia on wood products. And so these are decimating all three species in our Acadian forest. So slow the spread is what it's all about. Um, practicing good uh, biocontrol. If, if you have a, a lint roller, use that, keep one in your vehicle. Uh, if you don't have that, even some packing tape can really help uh, to just sort of, um, because you won't be able to see the crawlers, so it'll, it'll um, fasten onto those crawlers and keep them from going on to uh, a, a new forest that you may venture into. The best thing is to just take your clothes and throw them in the laundry. Don't go into more than one hemlock stand per day. And this is important when we think of uh, fishing this time of year, fishermen that may fish in one area and then change streams and go to another area. And streams tend to be lined with hemlock. And so they can easily infest a one watershed and then another. In the end, uh, this is what we see are these thinning canopies. So this was taken, I took this picture at Pollard's Falls, which is a protected area just a month ago. And it may look kind of normal, but when you look more closely, you can see that the new growth on the tips of these tall noble hemlock trees. This is some of the oldest hemlocks we have in the province. And you can see that they're missing their new growth, which is where the newest growth would be. It, it's all fallen to the forest floor. And so these trees are probably at this point, not even treatable because the trees have to be still producing new growth in order for us to treat them with uh, a chemical control, which I'll, I'll get to um, very shortly here. But before we talk about losing trees, let's just reflect on how important the Eastern hemlock is. It's considered a foundation species in, in, in that it creates its own unique set of ecological conditions that isn't provided. No other tree has this kind of ecological function. The hemlock uh, can actually makes its own microclimate and it, it's much more humid in a hemlock stand it can be cooler in the summer, up to 10 degrees cooler than above a hemlock canopy. It's warmer in the winter because these protective boughs intertwine above us and, and lock in the earth's warmth. And so it creates a, an intense shade. So it dictates uh, uh, what flora lives beneath its protective canopy. It is a preferred uh, winter habitat, winter shelter for our endangered mainland moose, and of course the white-tailed deer. Uh, Martin lived there, Fisher uh, will den in the roots of, uh, of hemlock. As well, I always think of the hemlock song in the spring, it, we're just beginning to get our, our warblers back. I'm already hearing yellow rump warblers as of yesterday. Uh, and so a lot of our breeding birds come back specifically to breed a nest in the hemlock canopy. And I'm thinking specifically of blue-headed vireos, black-throated green warblers, bay-breasted warblers in southwestern Nova Scotia tend to prefer uh, our eastern hemlock forest. Chimney swifts will, will, will roost or even we think they'll nest in the broken tops of um, hemlocks. And so these hemlock bird associate species are nearly all of them are in global decline. And so losing the hemlock from our forest ecosystem is, is yet another stressor on these birds that are already uh, going down. And so we, we do have a project um, uh, that's been put together by John Kearney called Listening Together, which is attempting to monitor hemlock bird populations and how they're going to change over time, particularly in the stands that are going to be heavily uh, affected, rapidly affected by hemlock woolly adelgid in the southwest. But we need to monitor also our hemlock that haven't been infested yet in the eastern forest. So if any of you are birders and you haven't yet signed up for the project Listening Together, reach out to John Kearney or, or Google uh, the Listening Together project. And I'd be remiss if I didn't, I guess I mentioned the chimney swifts, but as well, barred owls also like to nest in the cavities and broken tops of hemlock. And we often find them there as well as northern goshawks. 
So there's a very unique biodiversity in the hemlock forest. Uh, it's one of the best places to find the matsutake mushroom, uh, which is delicious. If you've ever uh, tasted the matsutake, you never want to buy store-bought mushrooms again. As well, we have uh, the Ganoderma suge or hemlock reishi, which is a bracket fungus uh, that uh, it has been known to have uh, cancer curing properties and has been more heavily researched in Japan. Uh, but it was known in particular for its potential for curing women's breast cancer. Um, and so we're losing, you know, this only grows on dead hemlock. So once we lose hemlock, we lose these species as well. We certainly lose Ganoderma suge. As well, Kinothecopsis suge, which is a little stubble lichen, which this is not its photo below, but it is a stubble lichen. It is a Kinothecopsis species. So they're very tiny, but it only... <laughs> it only grows on the resin of hemlock. So when the hemlock dies, this species will presumably not persist. And as well, the beautiful corin lichen, a coral lichen is uh, um, a lichen that, that prefers to grow on old growth hemlock. Eastern hemlock also uh, provides a very unique ecosystem service in terms of regulating the flow of streams. It tends to line these streams and it can cool the waters, which is very uh, helpful for salmon and, and brook trout, which are cold water species. Uh, and as well, just we, we need these hemlock to intercept uh, the, the heavy rains and the snow melts so that we, we don't have a straight flush into the streams. And so we know that streams remain higher as they flow through hemlock forests. And, and of course, this is good for the fish as well, and so and brook trout are known to be four times more abundant in the hemlock stream than in uh, uh, streams that flow through hardwood stands. But uh, this is a, a picture I took in 2020 on Sisabu River, already has uh, dead hemlock lining the whole distance of, of that watershed. Very disturbing. Well, I just wanna remind us of the role of hemlock and the climate change crisis that hemlock, uh, as well as all trees, it, they do this really wonderful thing with photosynthesis in terms of they take carbon dioxide and they uh, split the carbon molecule from the carbon dioxide and they'll store it in the tree. And so I put these little C's to remind everybody that carbon is being stored in the hemlock tree or, or all trees for that matter. And it's also then as it sheds its leaves or needles on the ground and, and breaks off boughs, a lot of that is broken down. Some of it's released back into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide, but an awful lot of it is decomposed and stored in the soil. And up to 50 to 60% of the carbon is not actually stored in the tree, but in the soil beneath the tree. So in order to keep that carbon in the forest, we also need to think about the carbon that's stored in the soil. And a really neat thing of photosynthesis, of course, is that it uh, has a byproduct of producing oxygen, which is handy for the rest of us that, that breathe the oxygen. So, um, so carbon from carbon dioxide, which is an excess greenhouse gas that we have too much of right now and is heating up our planet, the trees will sequester it and, and diminish that carbon dioxide that, that we have so much of in the atmosphere. And so it performs a, a, a very, very important ecological function. Uh, this is just some extra things that I plan to mention. I'm just going to scoot along. As we know that the planet is heating up, and here is uh, just a graph of uh, the global temperature rise as well as the carbon dioxide rise since uh, early days, since the 1800s. And you can see that uh, it, it's just rapidly going up. And so Hemlock has a very important function in the uh, in regulating climate. I, sorry, this keeps messing me up because I can only see part of the screen. Um, hemlock is particularly useful because it's it's uh, it starts photosynthesizing before our hardwoods get going. And you know our hardwoods aren't leafed out yet, and hemlock's already out there photosynthesizing on a nice day like we have today. So it's already sequestering this excess greenhouse gas. And the other nice thing about hemlock is it 
lives to be old growth. So it can sequester carbon for four centuries or longer. And the larger trees sequester more carbon than, than smaller trees do, than seedlings do, than younger forests do. And so this is just, it's even more important that we preserve our hemlock forest. And we like, I like to sum it up as hemlock eat carbon dioxide for breakfast. And so the loss of hemlock forests in Nova Scotia can lead to significant carbon dioxide emissions uh, if all of it dies at once. Uh, the Department of Natural Resources and Renewables is estimating that 16 to 21 million tons of carbon will be emitted. Um, and it's equivalent to one year total of provincial carbon emissions. And so it's, um, it's more important than ever that we keep, keep our hemlock intact, but it's going to be very hard to, to do without a lot of uh, human intervention over the next decade. So we know that tree cover is most, we, we need to maintain forest cover in order to uh, address the climate crisis. But I, I just wanna bring us to where we're at in Nova Scotia right now with forest cover losses uh, in the last, over the last 20 years. And the pink in this, this uh, screenshot from Global Forest Watch is the amount of forest cover loss that was detected from satellites in the year 2000. And in the year 2020, this is the full amount of forest cover loss that, that our satellites have detected. So all of these land, all this land base in pink are now carbon emitting and, and not sequestering those CO2 gases that we have too much of. And in the Southwest uh, or nearing the Southwest, it's the same idea. This was forest cover loss in 2000, the pink polygons. And in 20 years later, we've been clear cutting our forests. And this is how much forest cover loss there's been. It's, it's not a sustainable uh, forest industry that we've been supporting in Nova Scotia. And, and so uh, with it, it's also taken out a lot of, of hemlock forest, but um, this is adding to our climate crisis. So back to hemlock. Um, these are the gray ghosts, a picture of dead hemlock that I took on the Sisabu River system uh, last summer in July. And so just looking again and, and how that's going to affect the Sisabu watershed. Another picture of dead and dying hemlocks on the Tusket in a protected area. So control options, we look to control options going, how do we intercede? Well, sadly, Chemical control is the only thing we can do in the short term to, sorry, I've got sunshine straight on my, straight in my <laughs> eyes here. Uh, chemical control is the only thing that can, um, can control hemlock woolly adelgid in the short term. And if we integrate chemical control with biocontrol, we have a chance of keeping some of our hemlock forests conserved for future generations. Um, and this sounds, I know, very controversial for uh, to be sharing this with Nature Nova Scotia, but it's, it's where we, we're at right now. So bear with me. We're not talking about spraying chemicals like we do with, with glyphosate applications. That's pretty awful and pretty destructive to the forest ecosystem. Instead, we're talking about uh, micro injections of very small amounts of chemical as the sun is shifting outside my window here at the library. And so um, it's just very targeted applications. And so it's, uh, it's our only choice in the short term if you want to keep any hemlock trees alive as it comes to a place near you. It is a neonicotinoid chemical. It's called a Uh That sounds very bad, but how does it work? Well, it's a it binds to the neuroreceptors of insects. So the good news is it, it isn't toxic to you and me. It's not toxic to mammals or birds. Uh, um, and it, it's a, a systemic application. So it's conducted through the, uh, uh, the it, it's uptake through from the base of the tree to the canopy inside the tree. So the chemical that's available on the market in Canada is called Imaget. 
and it's it's rather expensive. We're hoping that there's a, another option available that's a little cheaper coming down the pipes uh, called Zytec. I have to keep moving this bar around. <laughs> so we have to remind ourselves too that it is subjected to stringent pesticide regulatory agency process they to get it approved in Canada and Health Canada oversees all of this. And there are uh, a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of research being conducted and still being conducted by Acadia University and Canadian Forest Service on uh, trying to um, um, regulate the non-target effects uh, uh, to address and see if there are effects to um, non-target organisms. So Elizabeth McCarty in the US has been studying um, this uh, metoclopred pesticide the longest and her research, uh, I'd advise anyone to, to read her paper. It is posted on the Nova Scotia Hemlock Initiative website that's administered by MTRI. As well, you may already have been using imidacloprid on your cats and dogs, as many of us are trying to deal with wood ticks and fleas uh, and deer ticks or uh, black-legged ticks. Imidacloprid is in the, most of those medications. In fact, it's often at a higher percentage, like 9% or 8% uh, imidacloprid versus uh, the imidacloprid that we inject in trees is only 5% and it's applied every five years whereas I've just administered it to our, our puppy and uh, it's gotta be administered about once a month. So I'm sure some of you are still concerned about birds. I certainly was when I started uh, looking at hemlock woolly adelgid and, and everybody was saying, we well, have to use chemical control. And, and uh, I, I, I very much disagreed and was immediately concerned about our insectivorous birds in particular um, but we now know that um, the uh, insects in the canopies rebound quickly in as little as two or three years. And uh, so the birds, the birds are really not affected. They just have different neuroreceptors. And so, and they tend to feed on living insects. And if the insects are dead, they're not going to feed on them. And certainly hemlock woolly adelgid is too small. The birds are not interested in feeding on hemlock woolly adelgid. So, and there are some papers that, um, that um, have, have delved into this, this uh, concern. And so what we know though, is what's worse for the birds is lo entirely losing the hemlock ecosystem. And this is what's happened all the way up and down the Eastern US um, is that uh, the hemlock forests have died. And so these, these forest songbirds have, have they have to switch to other forest types or they just reduce in numbers. So treatment timing is key to effectiveness. Uh, it's recommended uh, that you treat early in the infestation. Uh, the imidacloprid is conducted very slowly up the trunks of hemlock. It can take up to a year to get to the canopy. So old growth, they even recommend treating it before the adelgid reaches your old growth forest. Um, the trees have to be healthy enough to pull that product up into the canopy. And once it's there though, it protects the tree for at least four years. At de and depending on the product, if we do get Zytec 2F, um, which is a basal bark treatment, which I haven't explained yet, it might protect the trees for as, up to seven years. Just wanna show you what this looks like. Here I am injecting imidacloprid into the base of a hemlock tree. And you can see this is uh, called a quick jet air gun. There's different methods of injection. Uh, you saw pictures of um, the canisters, these little white canisters that are also used to administer it. The hemlock tree doesn't care how the imidacloprid gets into the tree, just as long as it does. Oops, I need to move on to the next. Oh, that's strange. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Uh, Zytec 2F is a basal bark treatment. So you, you spray it basically on the base of the trunk of the tree on the outside. And somehow the uh, Zytec gets inside the tree and is conducted into the canopy. Um, the good news about it is it's much faster to administer. So that cuts down on labor costs and it's, it's much, much cheaper. Um, 
There may be an application limit. We don't know because we're not allowed to use it in Canada. These pictures were taken because Canadian Forest Service, we were helping while I was at uh, Kejimakujik, helping the Canadian Forest Service to, to conduct these research applications. Um, but the price, uh, some of you are probably wondering what would a, a tree, a hemlock tree, say 40 centimeters in diameter, which is a pretty common diameter of, of a hemlock tree out there, um, that with Imaget, it would probably cost about $16. That's the kind you inject into the tree, whereas Zytec 2F that you spray using basil bark, if we get that into Canada, it would cost as little as $3.20. Um, so, um, I, I should mention, I put 40 centimeter DBH, that's a forestry term, it means diameter breast height, which uh, is usually measured at 1.3 meters from the ground, in other words, chest height or breast height, and then you measuring the diameter across, so a 40 centimeter tree would be the full diameter across. So where have we conducted these treatments? Well, in a number of places now, in Kejimakujik National Park, uh, some of the protected areas like McKay Lakes and Sistabu, uh, we're looking at Pollard's Falls, uh, um, doing more injections, hopefully treatments this spring. Um, that's to be decided yet. Um, and as well, uh, we have um, some private arborists that are injecting uh, chemical in um, southwestern Nova Scotia. And many cottage owners and woodlot owners are uh, starting to make uh, uh, Scott Robinson is in the picture. They're very, very busy uh, trying to save hemlock trees in that area. Sporting light, just to touch on that, it's a nature reserve in the middle of the Toby attic. Um, interesting, this is a shot of the Toby attic and you, you can see the, the pink polygons again are the forest cover loss where the industry has been clear cutting. And then the Toby attic is the satellite didn't detect any forest cover loss in this whole area that's protected, but Sporting Lake is here. It's a rare roadless intact wilderness area that had old growth hemlock. And so we decided to volunteer to go and treat the entire island last fall. So in October, in just 10 and a half days, we treated 15 hectares of hemlock forest uh, using volunteers, no one was paid. And so volunteers, we had to turn away volunteers on weekends. Uh, we had so many interested and people came from all walks of life and many areas of the province and everybody had an amazing time uh, trying to save these forest giants. And so um, back to a little bit um, about non-targets. Uh, I said that the Katie University and Canadian Forest Service is researching it. I just wanna, um, hit on this again. Elizabeth McCarty sums it up best. Um, she says the negative environmental consequences of hemlock mortality, which is what we're facing here, must be weighed against the known consequences of insecticide use to preserve hemlocks. So it is a trade-off, but so looking at um, what are these what are these impacts to the non-target organisms, the ones that we, the good insects that we don't want to kill like bees. Let's, I just wanna to touch on the fact that it is being studied. I cross out the fact that in the US they apply a lot of this imidacloprid to the soil directly. We don't do that in Canada, nor would I expect that we ever would. So we're injecting it into the trunks of trees, maybe spraying it on the base of the trunks of trees. But in any case, we're looking at, uh, getting it directly inside of the tree. Um, and then from there, um, we worry about though the impacts around the base of the tree. And we now know that we're at roughly only 50 centimeters from the base of the tree actually seems to contain any traces of the imidacloprid chemical and about 50 centimeters throughout the whole forest of hemlock that would rate be roughly represent about 2% of the forest that may contain any imidacloprid substance at all, substance at all. And um, it seems to have a very short term impact on um, springtails at the base of hemlocks as I shift the gain out of the sunshine here. And, and then in the canopy of the forest, um, there's a, a decline of, of the good arthropods in the canopy of the forest for about two years, and then they recover. And this is compared to though in the untreated hemlock forest, 
where the arthropods decline and never recover because the trees die. Um, and so we're also though looking at impacts to flowering plants and, and pollinators, although there aren't many flowering plants in a hemlock forest. And we remember that hemlock itself doesn't produce flowers, it's wind pollinated. And so it doesn't attract bees and, and other uh, insects uh, that would pollinate flowers. And we're also looking at the movement through soil to the, to the aquatic systems. But this is extensively used in the US and there seems to be very, 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 uh, well, inconsequential um, impacts to the forest ecosystem and aquatic ecosystem. Uh, just to mention also the Canadian Forest Service is also examining tree azen, which is an organic substance de derived from the neem tree. And this could lessen the neonicotinoid use. We really wanna minimize in any way that we can chemical use in our intact forest ecosystems. And so we're doing our best uh, while at the same time we address this ecological crisis. And so moving along very quickly, um, I, that was just a touch on that. Yes, there are, there's lots of research being conducted out there. This is a long list of what's occurring in Nova Scotia right now into non-target effects. So we're not a bunch of rodeo cowboys out there just uh, trying to uh, put chemicals in uh, old growth systems, but being very prudent about it. And in the long term, like we mentioned that chemical control is a short term approach that eventually, ultimately, we want the forest to be self-regulating again. And the long term answer is biocontrols, introducing predators from the West Coast, native Canadian species that in the West controls hemlock woolly adelgid, which is actually on the West Coast, not quite the same strain that we have in Eastern North America, but in any case, hemlock woolly adelgid does not kill the Western hemlock forests. And so we go there, we collect some predator insects, two of them, because we have to have a predator for each generation of hemlock woolly adelgid because there are two generations. And the idea is that we would build up these predator insect populations that would consume hemlock woolly adelgid and keep it in check. And so once again, we may have healthy hemlock forests in future. But the key is in the interim, because this is going to take at least 10 to 15 years in Nova Scotia to become successful at getting these predator populations uh, into Nova Scotia, uh, authorized. A biocontrol program is, uh, takes some, some government support um, to build and then, um, and then for these populations to build up enough to keep HWA in check. So in the meantime, we just have to keep our trees on a, on a bit of an IV system with chemical control until these are ready to go. And I had a news just in that the silver fly they just discovered last winter had survived one of the coldest winters in New York state. And so we now know that this, this predator insect that controlled the second generation of HWA will absolutely live in Nova Scotia if it comes in. And the idea then is to integrate the two, to have um, in the interim, to have the chemical control as the bridge solution until the biocontrol is ready. And then eventually you'd have just some trees chemically protected and eventually none of the trees chemically protected because the biocontrol will, will take over. Um, so it's, a, it's, um, it's going to be a, a bit of a dicey road ahead. Uh, and in the meantime, in Nova Scotia, we look at uh, we can look at Nova Scotia in this way is the red areas in the southwest are the heavily infested areas where rapid intervention, rapid response is needed desperately. We're losing forests, we'll lose more again this year. Um, they're just rapidly dying. It was in Bear River a month ago and those trees are dead. That, that Bear River is just very, makes me weep uh, with losing both its hemlock and its beech trees all within the last few years. But the Kenfield, uh, Kings County and Lunenburg County are on the leading edge. So here we can use a different strategy and maybe do the whack-a-mole approach where as soon as we detect it, we stomp it out right away. If we could go in and treat aggressively right away, we'll be able to keep those forests intact and maybe not have to treat the whole forest, but minimize the amount of chemical we use. And then in the green area, we're just building awareness 
and we'll do our best to you know keep an eye out and make sure we do our HWA surveys twice a year and um, uh, at, and then in the blue we're again just monitoring because we never know where HWA could show up next uh, it just could be somebody that just um, takes it uh, from camping in Kejimakujik National Park, for instance, could take it to Cape Breton Highlands. Um, in the leading edge, I, I draw attention to Berwick Camp. Some of you may know that area and the Kentville Ravine and Kentville Gorge. Those are some coveted places where hemlock forests are, are known and loved by the people that live there. And we just detected, detected uh, conducted detection surveys at the Berwick Camp uh, this past month. And uh, it wasn't found there, um, but certainly uh, the folks that uh, maintain the Berwick camp are very concerned about the hemlock there in amongst the cabins. And um, they know that the earlier that they, the more they stay vigilant and conducting their surveys twice a year and the earlier they detected, the cheaper the intervention will be. Um, we did find a lot of spider egg sacs. So there are a lot of lookalikes in the forest. So remember that the hemlock woolly delta really does look white and woolly, and it's always at the base of needles. It's not on the needles itself. And so it, even though you, the spider egg sacs might be about the same size as the hemlock woolly delta, they're just kind of lookalikes to keep us on our toes, I guess. And we just did a hemlock, uh, um, a detect, an HWA detection day at the Kentville Gorge. Uh, and, um, and we did find it there. And so, uh, but we had a successful day with many volunteers that showed up on May 1st and uh, learned how to detect HWA. And then um, this is a picture of Tom Herman, who was out, who's very much uh, um, not, he's, he's um, understanding that we need to uh, protect our hemlock forest to the extent possible with a short and long-term control uh, that, that this is truly, an ecological loss if we just allow our hemlock forest to die. Uh, Mi'kmaq communities are, we're building awareness and there's been a great deal of consultation through Kujik National Park, as well as the provincial government. These are two ladies that came down from Eskasoni to visit me a, a few weeks ago and they were quite astonished with what Bear River looks like. And then we went to the Tupperville Falls where hemlock is still green and, um, and uh, yeah, I think they share our concern. Uh, Jeff Purdy and Sherlyn Young from the KMK, Jeff, uh, Jeff Purdy from Acadia Band were visited us while we were at Sporting Lake and, and conducted a smudge ceremony, which was very much appreciated by everyone, all of the volunteers. I wanna wrap up because I know I'm running over time, but I know that many of you are going, well, is there any resistance out there? Is there any, natural genetic resistance. Um, there is a paper out uh, and, and a poster uh, that's available on a what was called a bulletproof stand that was found in the Delaware Gap area where um, amongst a backdrop of, of dead hemlocks, there were some strangely live green hemlocks that managed to survive the HWA infestation. And so people wondered if they were genetically resistant somehow. They've done some research on cuttings from those trees um, they look like they are more resistant to HWA, like they did grow taller uh, with thicker stems. They seem to be producing more, uh, more uh, defensive chemistry in terms of producing more terpenes and phenols. And so um, it shows some potential, although there's been other researchers I've spoken with that says that, this, that their research uh, needs needs some more work, that there's some flaws in the research. And so one researcher that I spoke with just last winter summed it up as, don't count on finding truly resistant trees, but look for them. So continue to look for them. And it's a very, you know, you never know. Uh, nature surprises us all the time. So the, 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 the strong message here is don't preemptively cut your live hemlocks. If they're alive and still healthy, you never know whether trees have HWA resistance. You're never going to know if you've cut your hemlocks before they've, they're actually dead from HWA. So um, that's the take home message there. And uh, many people are also going, well, what about planting? Can't we just um, plant 
new young hemlocks? Or, or what about if there was resistant trees? Well, then isn't that the answer? Well, maybe it would be the answer, but it's gonna take a long time to recreate the old growth conditions with all the biodiversity that our current mature and old growth hemlock forests protect. And so planting tiny seedlings is, um, is, is not really um, a, a solid answer to this problem. We need to protect, we absolutely need to protect the old growth. And Suzanne Simar, who was a, a tree planter in her early days before she became such a well-known researcher and, and wrote the book, Finding the Mother Tree, uh, was quick to point out that um, uh, trees in the forest are, are, are socially connected by this fungal network underground. And, and so they, they can send water and nutrients and carbon, carbohydrates to other trees, even other trees that aren't even of the same species. And they can, um, and so that's uh, very valuable to know. And so we, we talk about the mother trees being the old growth. So again, drawing back to a lot of our hemlock is in old growth condition. And so these mother trees, and remember suga means mother tree, she's connected to all, many, many other trees in the forest and she's sending nutrients to her seedlings so she can detect her next of kin and then transfer nutrients to those uh, seedlings uh, some distance away. And this is a, a bit what the mycorrhizal um, network looks like. There's the tree roots of the seedlings, but there's also these my mycelia or, or mycorrhizae uh, that um, can move, move things around in the forest, nutrients and water and so forth. But um, for those who think that planting is the answer, well, so much can go wrong. You can, you can, when they look at the success that tree planters have, they realize that here's <laughs> like, you can have the J root, the L roots, uh, you didn't compact the soil well enough, so there's an air pocket. So seedlings die for all kinds of reasons. And in the meantime, I find this is a very agrarian response. It's a very human uh, centric response to fixing uh, nature's problem when, and it costs a lot of money to plant trees. It, it, you have to buy the seedlings and then you have to pay someone to plant them. Whereas nature does this to our right. These are sugar maple seeding in. Um, and of course the mother trees out there are punting connecting those seedlings to the fungal network and punting nutrients to them and whatever they may need. And so the forest produces millions of seeds for free and plants them for us. So the, the best thing is to try to keep as much forest cover as we can, try to keep as much of our forest intact as we can. And um, uh, even if the hemlock forest dies from HWA, in, I know in New York State, Dr. Whitmore says he doesn't plant, they don't waste money planting seedlings that the forest will still seed something in. So unless you're in a Walmart parking lot or in an old forest where they have to compete amongst grasses, the best thing is probably let nature plant the seeds because remember this underground network of, of fungi and planting these seedlings, they won't be connected to the fungal network or at least not for a long, long time. So they're not going to fare as well as the progeny that the trees themselves produce in this in situ forest environment. Um, so we don't know what's going to wrapping up. We don't know what's going to happen in our forests in Nova Scotia because we know as much as we may chemically treat uh, some of our hemlock forests, it'll be a small fraction. Most of our hemlock forests will collapse from hemlock bleedalgid. Yellow birch may be what moves in to take over in many places and probably red maple. Um, but in, in the New England states, uh, Betula lenta, the black birch seems to be what's moving in. Um, so as I just said, we'll save only a small fraction of the old growth hemlock in Nova Scotia. But I'm hoping with volunteers, similar to what we did in Sporting Lake, that maybe we can turn to and weekend warriors and preserve our hemlocks along at least our riparian uh, forests, our, our streams to protect our stream health a bit. Um, uh, other species for sure will grow in the place of hemlock, but not 
beech or ash because they're also being impacted by invasive species. And our forests are destined to become less diverse because of all these invasive species. So once again, we're, we're drawn to uh, please try not to move wood products around and brush off your boots and your, um, your coats, your jackets and the dog as you move from forest to forest. Look out for other invasives like glossy, glossy buckthorn, which can overtake forests. That's probably going to happen a lot in the Truro area and in Southwest Nova Scotia, we've got a lot of glossy buckthorn. And so I sum up that forest preservation has a new urgency with the climate crisis, uh, excess greenhouse gases, and, and so, so many invasives coming at us at once in Nova Scotia, uh, it's, it, it's causing us to think differently on how we manage forests. A number of years ago, I would have been against assisted migration. A number of years ago, I would have been against chemical, using chemicals for anything. Uh, but um, this crisis that we're in has caused me to revisit some things and discern amongst chemicals that are good and bad, uh, or if they're used in small amounts, maybe we can consider them uh, uh, in the short term. And so that's my, my bumpy wrap up uh, that I'm hoping that I haven't left you without hope. I think there is hope, uh, but it's gonna take all of us to help work to preserve some of our last vestiges of old growth. We're going to have to do some active management if we wanna keep some of those forests alive. And that's it. Oh, Unity, you're muted. Thank you, Donna. Um, it looks like we have some questions in the chat. Uh, we have a question from James. Uh, he said, thank you for the very informative presentation. Do you consider forest diversification, introducing other species of trees, or the removal of a certain percentage of hemlock trees to be a viable option to reduce the overall population of hemlock woolly adulta? Uh, that's a really good question uh, because of course, having just retired from Kajimakujik National Park, I, I know that, that that's one of the things we're doing there in, in Jeremy's Bay Campground. For the most part, I don't uh, agree with uh, thinning. Um, Silvicultural thinning, uh, for the most part, doesn't work unless you're way out in advance of like 10 years out or, or longer before the HWA arrives. Otherwise, the trees are already stressed if they're already infested. So, um, and with the machinery we use in the forest today, um, you can end up doing a lot of damage to the residual trees that you plan to keep. Uh, and Mother Nature is going to diversify that forest all by herself. She knows how to diversify the forest when one species drops out. So again, um, you know, uh, every day that we can keep a large hemlock alive and sequestering carbon dioxide from our excess greenhouse gases is more valuable than planting a teeny tiny seedling that isn't going to sequester carbon dioxide at all. So when I evaluate the climate crisis that we're in, um, to me, it, it's uh, it, it, it's we we can meddle with it, I guess, if we want to. But every time humans seem to to do a lot of meddling, we end up making it worse. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, in the U.S., they've they've discovered that as the hemlocks slowly drop their needles and more and more light reaches the forest floor, that um, the forest does diversify on its own and it does seed in other species. And so I guess I go with the precautionary principle that I, I just, I get a little nervous when people go in and start uh, cutting down old growth trees um, and thinning and so on. So, and I don't like cutting trees preemptively before I know if they're genetically resistant is also a, a factor. So I'd rather just either treat the trees or wait and let nature figure out what she wants to grow there. Thank you. 
Uh, we have another question from Mark and Emily. Uh, thank you for this interesting talk. How can we get involved in this and other tree preserving initiatives? Is there a local group looking for volunteers? There, there is a local group looking for volunteers. Um, the best thing right now would probably be to contact, to contact um, uh, the Midway Community Forest Co-op because they were coordinating Hemlock Conservation Nova Scotia. That's the group that went out and, and brought together volunteers for Sporting Lake. Uh, nature reserve and so we do intend to continue to grow that group and the, there was just so much interest and it was such an amazing experience probably the most memorable experience of my life was spending those 15 days at sporting lake nature reserve and protecting those old growth hemlocks so glad if there's more interest out there i would advise you to contact the medway community forest co-op which is um actively interested in carrying on with treating um, our old growth forest. There's, there's right now, it, because this is all so new, it's not easy to uh, find a group that wants to pull this off, but that's probably the best way. That's, I should have been more ready for that question. But yeah, try reaching out to Jenica Hunsinger at the Midway Community Forest Co-op and she'll keep you informed. Thank you. Uh, MB in the chat says, these issues really bring our environmental values into direct collision. Um, Elizabeth said, thanks very much, Donna. Very informative and enjoyable um, as much as the crisis can be positive. Um, Shirley said, thanks for the informative presentation. It explained the dead trees. I noticed while traveling in the Annapolis and, and Digby County. Yeah. Um, YB and B again, we don't have enough tools to fight these things. It seems to me that bringing in yet more species to solve the problem is counterintuitive. It does actually seem like that's counterintuitive, but I, I didn't let people know that in the eastern US, they've been researching biocontrols for decades. And so the good news is we get to build on the, the research, the very, very careful research on biocontrols that they've been using in the eastern US. So they've done, we've learned a lot of things from biocontrols going terribly wrong in many other countries, Australia, of course, we know about the cane toads and all of that. So we wouldn't be doing this if there were other options. There are no other options. Um, and so, but they've done the starvation trials and these insects, when they're specialists. So when they run out of HWA to feed on, they die. And so the uh, scientists, the entomologists in the US have to keep bringing in new insects because if they run out of food, uh, they die. And so um, Hopefully, uh, you know, the Canada isn't going to allow us to use these insects unless uh, it's safe for a forest ecosystem. But this is a, a desperate measure to keep old growth alive. And of course, once we lose our old growth, it's permanent. We, we will never get it back. And the dependent species that live amongst those uh, mother trees in the hemlock forest. Mm. You're right. Uh, we need to protect our old growth forest. Um, so I have a question. If folks here today come across um, Hemlock Woody Adalja in their yard or like um, house owner and stuff, is there a way people can report this sighting? Yes, um, there is. Um, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency is ultimately who takes all the sightings, but there's there is just a new email uh, and I don't remember what it is. So I would um, direct people to uh, reach out to Medway, uh, the uh, MTRI, um, the Mersey Tobiatic Research Institute. MTRI has mm -hmm. the website, Nova Scotia. Hemlock. Just a second, I think I actually have, if I move on, I actually have 
referenced. Yeah, the Novus, if you can still see that screen, I don't know if you're still sharing my screen or not. Yeah, there it is. Um, the um, Nova Scotia Hemlock Initiative, which is uh, through MTRI, uh, should be the place where you can report these. And But there's also a new email, and I forget what it is, <laughs> uh, because it just came out uh, like yesterday, I think. So um, anyway, we're, this is still, you know, we've only known about this since 2017. Uh, and then it seems that it's taking us some years to get going. And this is like a slow moving fire that uh, calls us to just move as fast as we can to get things in place so that we can protect as much old growth as we can. Um, uh, but yeah, it's still a bit bumpy on where do you send your sightings and so on. But please do submit any and all sightings. Just keep asking, contact the province if you can't find anyone else and we'll get your sightings on the on the map. Great. Uh, thank you, Donna. So folks, if you don't have any more questions, then we'll leave it there for now. Uh, but if you have more questions, uh, we'll definitely make sure that Donna, you get Donna's email. And if you're not following Nature Nova Scotia on social media, definitely do and check out our website. We will be back in exactly a month, the first Tuesday of next month, which is June, and we will be changing gear a bit and moving into some marine conservation topics. It will be great, so tune in. Thank you again so much, Donna, for being with us tonight. Great presentation, and I learned so much about hemlock forests and hemlock woody adulja. Thank you, folks, for tuning in tonight. We will let you go. Have a good night. Thank you, Unity. Good night. Thank you.